it's Darius, and congratulations to I-75ers who let me know that they passed the CPA exam this month. See the green check marks? That means they're done. No more CPA review for them. But what about you? Are you connecting well with the material that you're using? You can still pass. You just might need to get on the right road. Go to i75cpareview.com and get yourself on I-75 with me. Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. I'll save a spot for you on next month's list. All right, here's an audit sim on statistical sampling. Here's the facts. In auditing receivables of a beverage wholesaler, Riley CPA will use statistical sampling to evaluate whether there was proper authorization for shipping the goods and to determine whether the resulting receivables are fairly stated. Riley has determined the following. So first they're giving us parameters for testing controls and what control does it look like is being tested? Whether there was proper authorization for shipping the goods. So we're gonna do sampling for attributes that means because when we test controls, the sampling is called sampling for attributes. And right away they tell us that the risk of assessing control risk too low is 5%. And what happens if you assess control risk too low? It means that you'll do less substantive testing and that could lead to an ineffective audit. So by taking a 5% risk of assessing control risk too low, it means Riley's being 95% confident of her ultimate assessment of control risk. Now they tell us that Riley can tolerate an error rate in the population of 7%. That's known as the tolerable deviation rate. Riley expects only a 2.5% error rate in the population, but could tolerate 7%. And then there's a precision they tell us is 3%, also known as the allowance for sampling risk. And in the end, 75 customer invoices will be sampled. And what's the audit procedure again? We're going to inspect invoices for proper authorization. Basically, Riley wants to know how often someone was able to order goods and receive a shipment without the customer's credit being checked. And Riley's only going to look at 75 customer invoices, no more than that. That's the sample size. And where do we get the sample size from? Well, they gave it to us. It's based on the parameters here. And if we had one of these 95% confidence tables that's set up for audit sampling, it would tell us that if our tolerable rate is 7% and our expected error rate is 2.5%, that we should look at 75 customer invoices. Question one wants to know, will the sample size increase, decrease, or remain unchanged at 75 customer invoices if the risk of assessing control risk too low is revised to 4%? Right now it's 5%. And at 5%, we're being 95% confident but if we revise this risk of assessing control risk too low down to 4%, then that means we want to be 96% confident. And the more confident we want to be, the larger the sample size has to be. So the answer is the sample size would have to increase if we took the risk of assessing control risk too low and revised it from 5% down to 4%. So the answer is increase. Because when using statistical sampling for a test of controls, the risk of assessing control risk too low represents the desired confidence level in the control conclusion. And at 5% risk, Riley was using 95% confident that the sample was representative of the population. If we revise that to a 4% risk, this increases to the need for a 96% confidence level from a 95% confidence. And the higher the confidence level, the larger the sample size. And the question asked, will the sample size increase, decrease, or remain unchanged 
if the risk of assessing control risk too low is revised to 4%, and the answer is sample size would have to increase. Same facts now for question number two. They want to know, will the sample size increase, decrease, or remain the same if the auditor increases the tolerable rate to 8%? Well, what's the tolerable rate now? 7%. That means the auditor can tolerate seven errors out of every 100 items. If the auditor can suddenly tolerate more error, like eight errors out of every 100 items, well, then the auditor doesn't have to look at as much, and that would result in a smaller sample size. So the answer to number two is decrease, because when the tolerable deviation rate increases from 7 to 8% here, that means the auditor is willing to accept more error and still be able to conclude that the control is effective. So whenever the auditor can tolerate more error, that means the auditor can get away with a smaller sample size. All right, question three now, based on the same facts. Would the sample size increase, decrease, or stay the same if the auditor determined that the credit manager was out of work for three months of the year due to surgery? Well, is the credit manager an important job when it comes to this particular control? proper authorization for shipping the goods. How important is the credit manager in that? The credit manager means everything because it's the credit manager's job to check the credit of a customer before approving the sale and allowing goods to be shipped. So if you have a consistent credit manager throughout the whole year, then you can expect the deviation rate of 2.5% to be consistent throughout the year. But if the auditor suddenly finds out that the credit manager was out of work for three months, that's going to quickly increase the expected deviation rate from 2.5% to something higher. And while the tolerable rate won't change, because the auditor can only tolerate a certain number of error, the expected error rate's gone up. So if you're expecting more error and you can't tolerate any more error, then your sample size will have to increase. So the answer to number three is increase. The credit manager's three-month absence suggests the control may not have operated consistently. So expected error rate goes up, goes up from 2.5% to something higher. And in attribute sampling, a higher expected error rate results in a larger sample size to maintain your desired confidence level of 95%. Just because you're expecting more error doesn't mean you can tolerate any more error. So if you want to remain 95% confident, then you're going to have to sample more if you expect a higher deviation rate. Okay, so far we have not needed the allowance for sampling risk, the 3% precision, but we're not done. Same facts now for question four. In evaluating the invoices for proper authorization, Riley CPA determines a sample deviation rate of 3.5% based on the 75 sampled invoices. Remember, the sample size is 75 customer invoices. So Riley examined 75 invoices and found 3.5% sample error rate. So this is basically new information. They're not giving us this information here in the facts. This 3.5% comes only from examining the 75 sampled invoices. They found an error rate of 3.5% in the sample. Now, will Riley conclude that the control is therefore effective, ineffective, or would this determination not impact the assessment of control risk? And to get the answer, we not only take the 3.5% sample error rate, the rate of error found in the 75 sampled invoices, but we have to add that to the precision, the allowance for sampling risk of 3%. And when we add 3.5% to 3%, that gives us an upper deviation rate of 6.5%. And the upper deviation rate is what we call the population maximum error rate. So this means that Riley thinks that in the population, the error rate could be as high as 6.5% based on the 3.5% error rate in the sample. So 6.5% is the 
upper deviation rate, now we just compare that to the tolerable error rate of 7%, and it looks like the control is effective. You always hope to end up where the maximum error rate, 6.5%, is below the error rate that you can tolerate. So the answer to question four is that the control is effective. And that's because with a sample error rate of 3.5% and a 3% precision, Riley will calculate an upper deviation rate of 6.5%. This means that Riley believes that the error rate in the population based on the sample could be as high as 6.5%. And that's good news because since 6.5% is less than the tolerable error rate of 7%, Riley will conclude that this control is operating effectively. All right, similar facts for question five, not exactly the same. Let's see what's different. They tell us that the allowance for sampling risk, the precision is now 5%, no more 3%. And here's question five, in evaluating the invoices for proper authorization, Riley determines a sample deviation rate of 3.5%, so that's the same based on 75 sampled invoices. But the facts now say that the allowance for sampling risk or precision is 5%. Will Riley conclude that the control is therefore effective, ineffective, or would this determination not impact the assessment of control risk? And if you think you know, leave me the answer in the comments section. This is an actual simulation video from I-75 Audit. All I-75 sims are instructor-led for maximum learning purposes, just like this one. And if you found this video helpful and you want to see the rest of it and more videos like it, go to i75cpareview.com and get yourself on the right road to passing audit. Get on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. I'll leave a link in the description.